This is Remo Daily, your daily dose of inspiration. Our guest today is a journalist and digital media executive. Please welcome live on Remote Daily, Anita Celina. Welcome. Thank you so much for, for inviting me to be here today. I'm very much looking forward to it. Anita, let's start with the big question of today and uh, put you on the spot and ask you to put it in just one phrase for us. What do media organizations look like in the future? If, if you were to have to write a tweet, which you do a lot, <laughs> what would you write? I'd probably write a tweet thread <laughs> because it's hard in one tweet. Um, I think media organizations, um, I, I think one, one, one element of proof is that there is not one universal kind of operating model that works for every organization. I think what we're seeing is that uh, both on the, on the end of scale and gigantic scale and platformization and streaming, that there is a lot of, you know, a very high growth, gigantic segment of organizations, but we also see a lot of the opposite, right? We see kind of the return of niche and of very kind of hyper locally focused organizations, a lot of uh, community driven and community oriented media organizations. And a lot of the interesting things that I'm seeing these days are actually happening on that end of the spectrum. The other thing that I see is a trend that, that actually you know, is, is very well written about in research. And your colleague was kind enough to share some of the links I provided. Uh, the, the one I'm talking about now is for the Digital News Report, which is one of the biggest studies done every year, looking at a variety of countries and regions of the world and kind of analyzing trends in consumption behaviors. How are people consuming journalism? What platforms are on the rise? How is the willingness to pay for news kind of changing in different parts of the world? Um, and the interesting thing, the trend that you can see there is that shift towards subscriptions, like that world that we all kind of realize in the last five to 10 yeah. years, digital subscriptions have become that much bigger thing, right? Is also a winner takes all or a winner takes most market that we see the New York Times like three or four times mentioned as the one newspaper subscription right. in the chat here is very common. So people tend to have one national paper if they have a subscription they sometimes have additionally one either hyper local or very niche specific like newsletter subscription unless they are total like journalism nerds or kind of in the industry they usually don't have like three different papers so a winner takes most market is hard to navigate unless you're the winner very interesting. The New York Times had an article a few months ago, which I think the headline was something along the lines of, is the New York Times becoming too big? <laughs> uh, and only the New York Times could publish such an article, of course, um, like this kind of insight looking thing, because they're growing every day and they're doing it very smartly. But as you say, it, they are up there with Netflix in a way, right? You have this one newspaper and then you have this one thing where you, where you stream and then there's maybe a few others. But it, it is monopolizing and it also means that, and we're going to talk about that today, talent gets kind of like sucked into these, the winners and a lot of others are, are bleeding and having a much harder time in staying on their level of mm. coverage or their level of content. It also, what, what struck me about your response was also that as a New York Times, I might not even be looking at the Washington Post when I look at competition today. I might be looking at Netflix and how they do things and what people they hire. Is that right? I think to a certain extent, you always look at competition as in, you know, the, the most familiar thing around you. So I'm, I'm, I'm very sure the colleagues at the, the Post look at the Times and the other way around, because obviously it's kind of your, your most similar kind of player in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But of course, you're right. I mean, the New York Times is uh, the New York Times is growth uh, growth market is mostly not in the U.S. and it's mostly um, uh, you know in regions where the New York Times 
is a well-known brand but hasn't monetized that yet mm -hmm. it's a lot in non-journalistic well non-journalistic is maybe the wrong word but it's not in traditional news right if you look if you read the the annual report of the new york times very closely you're going to see that a lot of the growth comes from things like the new york times cooking app the new york times crosswords app it comes from acquisitions like wire cutter where they do like testing of whatever a pet uh, a, a, a pet store, a kind of, you know, uh, pen, uh, a, a mixer for the kitchen and kind of uh, monetize with affiliate links and affiliate marketing. So I think um, I think that, that the New York Times and many, many large media organizations also realize that um, business models that don't just kind of monetize content, business models that empower community, that provide guidance, that... Um, monetize insights or special knowledge are actually mm -hmm. much easier um, to transform and much easier to grow than business models that purely say, give us money so you have access for content. Because Felix, I, I, I'm quite sure that folks here in this, in this group now, people who are supporters or patrons um, of Remote Daily, they don't just do it because you provide them with kind of a newsletter, right? They, they do it to be part of a community, be right. part of a movement, to meet like-minded people, right? And I, yeah, and I told Yvonne today, who, who just uh, reached out before the show about, about her, uh, her, her being a member of the community, I said, we haven't done enough for our members at all. We're still in the very beginning of figuring this whole thing out while others are already so much further and, and so much bigger in the niches. But there's a very interesting question here in the chat taking us to a completely different place from Eileen, who said, what about LinkedIn? Uh, a lot of people pay for LinkedIn, myself included. LinkedIn is owned by Microsoft. LinkedIn has a news team, though. Do you, Anita, do you consider LinkedIn media? I mean, LinkedIn definitely has a lot of elements from media and is growing into that direction. So they've been recently pretty aggressively hiring journalists and hiring uh creators and hiring people to produce original content for LinkedIn. They built mm -hmm. a, a creator. I, so one of the programs that I run at the school here is, is a program for journalism creators. So basically a program for folks who want to start their own thing and monetize that. Mm -hmm. So we are obviously kind of taking, uh, taking a good look at the competition that's out there in terms of uh, training programs. And LinkedIn just started their own like creator academy thing where they uh, mm. They try to kind of help people to come up with unique ways to tell stories on LinkedIn. So oh, wow. I think there is an argument to be made that a lot of these platforms are are, are at least partially uh, becoming uh, or trying to become media companies. But there is also the other way around, right? Facebook is currently kind of pulling back from all these things. They, they wanted to play in that kind of journalism space. And then they realized that it's a very tricky space to play in and very hard and, you know, very, very full of like misinformation and policy and legislation. So now they're like, oops, we maybe don't even want to kind of you know, be, we don't even want to have a news tab anymore, right? Let's leave that to someone else. Fascinating what you just said about LinkedIn. I haven't, I haven't heard that. Um, and I just, I think uh, the, the link I found first was not even uh, the right one. But here I found a, um, an article hmm. from The Hollywood Reporter yeah. saying that LinkedIn launches Creator Accelerator Program. Um, I think it launched already in India, but it's also launching in the U.S., fascinating what's going on on that platform so thank you for bringing us up to speed here and um now let's focus on you as anita media executive for a moment because your career had a trajectory that i haven't seen with any other media leader that, that i know you began as a journalist and then spent the last 15 years in strategy and management education development you have seen a lot of corner offices um you have had more executive roles and driven more journalistic innovation than, than most in, in a german-speaking world and now coming here to the us so as you have seen so many media organizations from the inside what do have you developed some sort of a formula for them to innovate if a media organization calls you today and say anita can you please help us is there something that you can bring to them already that you have honed over the past couple of years that a model that works? It's a good question. I mean, I, I, I really think when it comes to both innovation and transformation, I really think one of the, the, the realizations that you have when you work in that space for a while is that while there are frameworks and you can get inspired by best practices and obviously experience helps and insights help, 
there is really no blueprint, right? There is really no blueprint for innovation. Okay. There is really no blueprint for culture change. There is really no uh, blueprint for successful business model development. There are, of course, tools and frameworks and skills and learnings that are somehow universal, right? We all uh, see kind of themes recurring. We all know, uh, we, you know, when you have experience, you see something going into the wrong direction and you're like, oops, that is not looking good, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that the tricky part is that you really, every media organization is different because its users and its audience is mm -hmm. different, right? And the way you interact with the remote daily members and audience members is different from the way the Washington Post interacts with their audience members and different from the way Morning Brew interacts with their newsletter readers. So I, I, I really truly think that the core of every successful innovation, transformation, culture change in the organization is kind of a deep analysis of what you are and who you are and what your kind of gaps in like opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, opportunity gaps and kind of, you know, also challenges are um and that's different for everyone okay okay so there's no there's no formula because as you say like every user base every target group every community is so different that you instead of looking at how others do it you should really look at what do the people need that i want to serve yeah um, i mean ultimately listen the thing about innovation is uh, ultimately it's not about technology right ultimately it's about mm -hmm. changing human patterns of behavior um and humans are are aren't machines <laughs> so yeah, they don't function in blueprints right they don't function in kind of cookie cutter models even if some business books might you know might want you want to make you think that if you buy this one book you kind of have the answers and i just mm -hmm. think it's not like that and I, I think that the, the the conversation that was going on here in the chat about spotify also shows that right that some of the platforms have gone into directions with their content that people didn't like. So they say goodbye. I'm not a part of this community anymore, even though a part of my life evolves around that. I think uh, one shared in the chat, you have your own playlist that takes you to sleep every day or your kids have been playing with this tool and building their own, you know, uh, stack of content. But you say, no, I, I don't identify with this anymore. I don't want to be part of this community. So I, I'm out of here. And um, when you you have access to a global community of, of media executives in the making through CUNY, through the, the executive program that you host in, in news innovation and leadership, I have always found that fascinating. It's kind of this little UN of journalists that you have been building <laughs> over the past couple of years coming from all continents, from all over the world. They're coming physically to New York, if possible so, uh, in post-pandemic times. But you also, of course, teach virtually a lot. What do you actually do? teach them like what is something what is a skill that somebody who is going to be a future leader of a media organization mm. needs today what is, what what is that what is an example for so that? really i think so most people come to us and they already bring you know plentiful experience in you know journalism and leading teams and and having interesting roles in newsrooms but they come because they feel they feel they reach a point in their career where where their skills need to be updated, their skills in managing teams, in leading transformation, in figuring out the questions that you just talked about, right? How do you actually innovate? How do you decide which platform to use and which not to use? How do you, how do you figure out in this kind of gigantic mess of uncertainty, how, to, how do you give your team a sense of safety and security without lying to them, right? How can you kind of be aware of your own uh, cluelessness about the future but still be an inspiring leader mm -hmm. um, who manages to kind of show empathy and uh, certainty to a certain extent. So I think if you ask me what the, the skills are that we, that we try to kind of teach them in this executive program is really how to manage uncertainty, how to wow. manage in a world that has no certainty anymore, that's changing, where life is going to throw curveballs at them as managers all the time, where they have to make really difficult decisions. How do you deal with digital platforms? How do you okay. make decisions about which markets to target? But also, how do you have, um, how do you lead hybrid teams where someone's in the newsroom and someone's at the other end of the United States or the world? Uh, so I think managing and leading teams, not just in journalism, everywhere, has become so much more complex. And I think many people 
who we encounter and who I encounter in leadership roles in media have not been prepared for that, right? They kind of just fell up the ladder <laughs> to a certain extent because they used to be great journalists. And then someone said, oh, we need someone to kind of lead the international team. Can you do that? And then they're like, yeah, I, I, I think I can. I mean, I'll try. But I've never but, been trained. You no, know, they've never been like trained and never mm -hmm. had the support network to actually understand what leading and managing and orchestrating change and transformation really means. So that's the... That's that's kind of the gist of the program. Hmm. Wow. I mean, I, I when I went to journalism school, journalism was still the gatekeepers, the know-it-alls, and it, this is the way they came into our classroom. They were like, uh, I'm an old white guy. I know how the world works, and here's what I'm going to tell you about it. Um, now you say it's uncertainty, and a lot of journalists have to learn how to say, I, I don't know, and have to become leaders based on it. However... When I talk to my peer group or my family, I, I also realize there's a growing distrust into the profession in general. How do you deal with that mm -hmm. as a media organization? Uh, do you wh like what do you see when you talk to all these media leaders from mm -hmm. all around the world? Have some of them found answers to that? Or is it still a result from the era where journalists were know-it-alls? Um, wh what do you think? I mean, trust is, you don't even have to, to focus it on journalism, right? But think about who you trust, like both which institutions do you trust, which human beings do you trust? Most likely those are people who you kind of know somehow, you feel you know them. It's very hard to trust something or someone if you don't have some kind of relationship. It's most likely people who come across or organizations or associations that come across as somehow authentic so you're not likely to be, you know, you're not likely going to trust an organization or a person who you feel is not sincere and not authentic and is kind of lying to you. And then most likely it's also organizations or human beings that treat you with a certain kind of respect, that mm -hmm. kind of show you a certain kind of appreciation and uh, show you a certain kind of respect in recognizing your value that you bring to the conversation or the collaboration. Now, let's transfer those three elements uh, to, to media organizations. I would argue that media organizations in the past um, have not always been great in building that relationship okay. with their readers and communities. I argue that in the past, they've not always been cre great in creating that transparency. This is how we do things. This is why we do things. This is why you're reading this story today. And I'd argue that also sometimes have not been very respectful in how they treat their subscribers or readers. They've sometimes just kind of treated them, you know, as these are the people that pay money so that we can do our thing here, right? So I feel these things, uh, and I'm, I think we're not at the stage anymore where every organization is bad at doing that. So I think there is a transformation in progress, but, um, but I think those three elements need to significantly improve if we want to increase trust in media. And I okay. think part of the reason why we see that in general, and there is enough science to prove that local or hyper-local organizations or community-based media organizations have higher levels of trust is because they excel in those three categories, right? <laughs> they are closer to their communities. They are mm -hmm. more authentic. They are more respectful. And they truly kind of listen to the communities they serve. So I think there is a, a definite correlation between the level of community embed and engagement and authentic relationship building and the level of trust. So let's geek out for a moment and I invite everyone to uh, to join us. What are what are some local or hyper local news organizations, Anita, that you have that you are maybe consuming yourself uh, at, over there in Brooklyn or in New York City, or ones that you have seen through your students, uh, through other collaborators, where you say those are outlets, these yeah. are teams that I think are worth watching or that I enjoy yeah. consuming myself. And I invite everyone uh, who is here to put in the chat as well what are newsletters locally, local media that you're consuming that you actually trust and that you like and support. Yeah. So I think, Felix, one of the interesting things is that um, the, the element of niche can take many, you know, can take, have many angles and many perspectives. So sometimes it's like hyper local and sometimes it's just because someone's like treating a niche topic that only you are uniquely interested in 
in a way as if it was the most important topic of the world. I have a friend um, who is super interested in marine life, um, like totally nerdy geeking out about like old animals that live in the sea. And there is a newsletter, I, I don't have it here, but it's, I, I'm sure you can Google it. There is a newsletter that is purely focused on like weird sea creatures. And I think she'd be willing to pay like 200 bucks for that a month because this is like her, her, her weird sea creature lifeline in a way. So what, I, what I'm saying is it's so different for everyone. I'm like, I'm a big foodie. So I like really, really, really am interested in specifically local food, specifically like food from various global diverse communities. I'm a big fan of, for example, the New York Times. There is a new New York Times newsletter um, by a journalist um, who kind of explores the different boroughs and kind of, you know, spends spends time in weird noodle parlors somewhere in the basement of a of a Queens department <laughs> store and stuff like that. I'm like I'm like totally addicted and I would pay for that newsletter. If I hadn't wouldn't have a New York Times subscription, I'd pay for that newsletter myself. Is that um, where morning Zoo is also such where a to eat? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I, I, I love, I love it. I'm like, like literally every newsletter. I kind of afterwards write her an email, and I'm like, oh my god, this is like the best newsletter. Why haven't you? She only started it a few months ago, uh, and I'm like, where has it been my whole life? Um, the other Fantastic. place there is like a, a website that's called Green Pointers, and I live in in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. So uh, Green Pointers is amazing. It's led by a fantastic um, a woman of color, um, Asian woman who also is like super active in the community. Um, and it's just kind of a, it's hyper local. Greenpoint is this tiny, tiny slice in North Brooklyn, right? But it's just about everything Greenpoint. Everything wow. from kind of, you know, uh, the post office closing down to the new hipster bar kind of opening. Um, so it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So those so are just two that I would mention. <laughs> yes, I, I just put my neighborhood newsletter or, or portal in there. I think it's been around forever. It's called the West Side Rag. And I read it because it's so close. It's just very, very close. It's It could be on my street or my block or whatever's happening. And the comments are are very emotional sometimes because people feel very emotional about their neighborhood. And this is what you just told about Green Pointers, which I haven't heard of, which is fascinating. Yvonne shared uh, WNYC. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's where, and, and Pamela is also chiming in also, oh, fellow green pointer. There you go. Yay. Um, so this is what we care about. And I guess this also builds trust, right? When you have people that you feel are close by or in my neighborhood and they see things before I do, I start to trust them and I start to follow them. And here's another, um, opportunity for, for new media organizations to, to pop up. And, um, thank you for sharing that with us now. Um, you have, of course, seen in the chat that we had a, a few, um, you know, comments on what happened to Twitter recently. And Twitter has been a lifeline and I would even say a career ladder for journalists for a very long time. They're all on there. They're all debating every day. A lot of it's inside baseball, but it's needed. It's it's often hilarious. It's often important. It often forms things that then show up in articles or on TV stations elsewhere. Is that how, how do you look at the whole discussion that's going on with Twitter and this potential takeover right now? Yeah. And how does that tie into what you maybe recommend to others who are building their platforms right now and mm. who might look into similar futures? I mean, listen, obviously I'm, I'm like, Twitter is a big part of my life and my, my professional career. I, 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 don't think I overstate things when I say I would not be where I am without Twitter because wow. uh, one thing that is sometimes hard to understand if you're if you're you know based in the US east coast of the US have that background is that if you come from a tiny tiny not important <laughs> media market where I'm from Austria uh, a country that is not known for innovation a country that doesn't have a lot of kind of you know uh, innovative schools or publications or anything and you kind but of want food. to but great food but that, that doesn't you know that doesn't help you if you want to do something <laughs> in media innovation i would never have been able to build the bridges mm -hmm. i built early on in my career if i hadn't like super actively engaged people on twitter i think today i might use I, it might be linkedin more than twitter but i just was like obsessive in kind of writing people who mm -hmm. i just kind of knew uh, but not personally, just kind of followed them and just kind of 
writing them and saying, could we do like a virtual coffee or I'm coming to New York wow. for a visit? Could it's I kind of networking. meet you? So it's pure, it's mm-hmm. networking, but it's also just like it, suddenly things, suddenly people become more, you know, approachable that are super far away from you. And I really, I still truly enjoyed it about Twitter. I, I still have my DMs open. People write me the, the weirdest and most wonderful messages. They're like, okay. I, I, we don't know each other, but I've been following your life. And can we kind of grab a coffee? And I'm like, of course. Uh, so I, I do, I, I, I personally feel very sad about what's going on at Twitter. I have a lot of good friends working there. Um, I feel sad for them, but I also am freaking out about the fact that maybe Twitter might be like my Twitter in the way right. it is now might be gone at some point. Um, but you know, it is what it is. I think we just, one thing that I'd realistically that I'd kind of say to someone who's like thinking about which platforms do I use to like build my brand or whatever, just be aware that whatever platform you use, <laughs> someone else has the key to that house and can can shut the door anytime, right? That is that is so I think I, I think about so many times when I look at Instagram influencers or now TikTok who spent their lives or years over years over years building this audience. And of course, you know, we all make choices in, in what platforms we use. But what do you just say? Somebody else has the key to that house and like that can can just lock it forever. Yeah. Or just or just let somebody open the doors to someone you don't like and that person now owns the yeah. house. And I think and you just there is not really anything you can unless you're a billionaire, then it's great. Then you can just buy Twitter and prevent uh, Elon Musk from buying Twitter. But I I, I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there is a billionaire here in our Zoom call, then I would kind of uh, implore them Let's to think around. through if, whether they want to, <laughs> whether they want to invest in something meaningful, journalism or Twitter. Um, but uh, unless you you are that, I think there is nothing you can really do about that. But what you can do is you can you can be your authentic self and build your community and your brand and your network. So that even if Twitter or LinkedIn or whatsoever goes away, you're still the same human being and you still have your connections and you still have, uh, you know, you're, you're still the same person, right? Get that Rolodex out. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I mean, I also thank you, Deb, for, invi- for reminding us that the White House is on- also only just a house, but at least we can partly, you know, decide who is uh, getting the keys <laughs> and who doesn't. That's um, true. <laughs> I I'm I'm so intrigued by what you just said, uh, Anita, and it, it, you know, it's 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 so interesting that you owe so much to this platform, and you're now so emotionally connected to it. You have your community there, but you're already like getting more engaged on LinkedIn. Also, maybe because you see there might be more future to what I do on this other platform, and I think that's what we have to accustom ourselves to. Also, not also not only change in general in the world, but also changing the platforms we use because. There's new ones coming up every day and they might serve us better than the ones that were there before. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about fake news because it came up in the chat. I know you're not a writer. I know you don't put out news every day and it's been a long time since you have done it because you have leading or been leading organizations. But still, especially where we are right now and we see it happening in local news in the US and it's just a precedent for what's going to happen in Europe as well, uh, that local news are dying and other platforms are taking their spot and often they're not well intended and this at the grassroots level is part of a much bigger problem of what we now call fake news have you seen any promising examples of organizations that go go against that tide and if so can you maybe share some examples Mm. for all of us to latch on to and say here we go uh it's getting there's there's a glass half full uh, moment in this so i think the the glass half full um element of this is there is a very good and excellent recipe against misinformation and disinformation. And that's strengthening quality journalism specifically in local communities. So there is an excellent, we actually know the solution, right? We know that if we manage to create, to support, to foster quality news, specifically in communities that don't have them anymore, uh, call them news deserts or call them whatever you want, We know that if we manage to do that through a combination of legislation, uh, support uh, systems, tax credits, but also us, all of us, I mean, stepping up and buying those subscriptions and donating and getting those membership fees going, 
being willing to invest, you know, pretty much the amount of two or three cafe lattes a month in supporting hyperlocal news. That would uh, that would kind of you know be the most effective tool we all have um, to to fight that fight because the big uh, danger appears in communities that do not have those trusted news sources anymore. And sadly, specifically in the United States, the amount of those communities is 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 crazy and is increasing every year. So every year there are gigantic communities in the U.S that lose their last kind of, you know, quality journalism, paper of record, whatever it is. And that are then these gaps, these holes are then being filled by propaganda. Um, and that is obviously extremely dangerous. Now, of course, there are also ways to tackle kind of the, you know, the wrongdoers. There are also ways to tackle the propaganda sites, but that's, a, that's something of a different issue, right? Because legislation mm -hmm. comes in, regulation comes in, uh, platform conversations comes in. It's very hard for kind of the solo person to do something about that. Uh, you can vote, but, right? Uh, that, that is one thing you can do. But, you know, you can kind of, you know, lift up that other side, uh, that other part of the calculation. But it, it, this might be a, might sound like a stupid question, but, but what if my news, my local news is gone? Like, what if it is gone already? Like, how do I support? Yeah. How do I support it? How that's do I, is there that's like an a, amazing an question. Or? Uh, there are so that is an amazing question, Felix, because there are, that is actually a question that a lot of us in the in the kind of journalism ecosystem are asking ourselves. Like, how can we kind of plant those seeds? And there are a lot of uh, initiatives that are working on planting those seeds. One mm -hmm. of them is an organization called Lion Local. Uh, local in well, local in well, news network. I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it's uh, it's the kind of the, an association of local news, and they they uh, push a lot of money, philanthropic money, into kind of fostering growth uh, of new startups. Um, so there is currently a lot of kind of philanthropic action going on, trying to kind of plant those little mini seeds um, in uh, local communities all okay. over the U.S. Uh, so donating, donating to organizations like that or donating your time and knowledge to organizations like that is a great way to do that. Um, there is um, something called the National Trust for Local News, an organization that uh, a friend of mine uh, runs that has this ambition to, you know, that a lot of venture capitalists and hedge funds are kind of buying up local news. That is usually not so great because they could just kind of squeeze out the profits and then three years later, <laughs> uh, you know, throw things out. Um, but there is another way to do that. So the National Trust for Local News basically says, what if a, a, a kind of good collective buys newspapers and tries to help them, like local newspapers that are close to dying and tries to help them towards digital transformation, right? With a non-profit lens. Uh, so there is a lot going on in that space um, and you can donate, you can donate your time, you can support those efforts. The best way I think to do that is if you look around yourself and you see you, there is a trusted local news source that's kind of, you know, trying to get by um, and who you want to still have in five or 10 years to kind of go out there and uh, buy a subscription or membership or donate. Um, or if you're in an organization, kind of offer a free partnership, mm -hmm. uh, whatever you can do. Fascinating. Thank you for sharing that, this with us. I put it in the chat, Lion, Local Independent Online News, and the National Trust for Local News are two organizations that are trying to do just that. To fill these gaps, fund local news startups. And if you give money or donate to them or you get engaged with them, this is where you help planning the seed for future independent local news. Uh, and you, you swim against the tide. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. For the, for the end of our conversation, I can't believe the hour is already over. <laughs> um, Anita, thank you for being here and sharing so much with us. For the end, I would just like to jump far ahead because uh, it's, it's sometimes easy for us to like you know, talk about next few months or a year, but we just hosted a, 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 a diversity and inclusion leader from, from Amazon um, the other day, Sage Kealohilani Kiamno. I'm so proud I can't say her Hawaiian name now. The, uh, who said, who told us, when I asked her about the future of her work at, uh, with, uh, with Amazon, with the second largest employer in the US now, she said, I expect Web3 and the metaverse to become a major part of our work. 
And I expect that we will have a lot more meetings in virtual spaces and all of our work is actually going to happen there. And I was like, whoa, okay, I haven't heard that clarity before from somebody who is leading mm -hmm. teams and, and, you know, uh, and many of us here in, in the room are people leaders as well. So as a final question to you, do you, do you expect media to do the same? Do you expect media to actually hop into the metaverse and Web3 <laughs> and we will see the first publisher, the first newsstand and whatever Fortnite or, or Decentraland or whatever the next multiverse that's coming at <laughs> us? Uh, do you think that's going to happen soon? So, I mean, I do think like, listen, with, with many of these, uh, many of these like big trends, right? Um, the, 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 the line between hype uh, and transformation is always very thin. Um, so I'm always very skeptical of that. This is the one big thing that's going to change everything. Because if we look mm -hmm. back in history, it was never the one big thing, right? It's a culmination of societal changes, technological changes, transformations that happen and that ultimately kind of lead to, to something new. Um, I do think the metaverse is, is fundamentally interesting for, for media and broadly speaking, content producing entities, whether that's creators uh, or large organizations. Uh, we actually are organizing um, um, a summit uh, on that on June 17. I'll, I'll put the chat oh, cool. in the um, I'll put the link in the chat uh, if you want, uh, called the Journalism uh, Creator Summit focused on Found journalism, it. entrepreneurship, and Web3. So what okay. NFTs, DAOs, new community uh, measurement, um, what all of those, um, what all of those um, events are basically, um, what all of these opportunities are basically potentially going to be doing for journalism. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some interesting things going on, right? Uh, we, we're going to have the, the president uh, of Time Inc. Uh, keynote us and Time has gone super deep into NFTs and producing NFTs to kind of, you know, uh, monetize and create an additional business model. Uh, okay. We also had um, see that a lot of those creators that kind of have you know niche brands and newsletters uh, do community building with DAOs and basically do community buildings um, that are uh, that are uh, build community building that's highly effective to create hmm. community buy in. So I do think it's very exciting. Is it going to be that one thing? I don't know, but I think Another it is very thing. exciting for content and media. Fascinating. Anita, you are in a transition yourself. You are uh, unfortunately, uh, well, for us here in New York, you are going to spend less time here and more time uh, overseas in Austria. Um, how can we uh, support you going forward? What can we do as a community for you? Oh, that's, that's a very nice thing to ask. Well, I mean, stay in touch. You have my LinkedIn. I'd love to connect. I'm kind of, I'm kind of living this weird nomad life between the US and Europe. So I'm, there is a, a big likelihood that you're going to uh, catch me somewhere at least. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to stay in touch. We would love to stay in touch too, Anita. This has been such a fascinating hour uh, with you. And um, if anybody has their camera on, I would say this is a good moment to send some virtual glitter uh, to Anita, our fellow <laughs> traveler through the nomad world of work. Uh, thank you, Anita. Um, have a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. This is Rima Daily.